Okay, hi to everyone again for the last day of, uh, of this uh, workshop. Uh, today, after the nice lectures of uh, Matt and Ben, we have Thomas again, who is going to make all this nice material at work to uh, unveil very interesting physics. Like he advanced his test lecture. So, Thomas, please. Well, Perfect. thanks a lot. Yeah, so this is exactly the goal of these lectures. And um, so essentially, the idea is everything which you have learned in the well, almost everything which you have learned in the last uh, days, we now want to bring together. And of course, this is a, it's a, it's a challenging task because maybe to some of you, this material was rather new. Yeah? And then, of course, in the mathematical language, it's, it's more formal and and then it's way tricky to make this transition into physics at times, right? And, um, and therefore, I decided to, to start with a short recap of things which have been said already, but I want to, I want to mention them again and maybe, maybe highlight a few aspects and give a, a few things which, which I know better where, where, what, what physicists kind of feel comfortable with, mentioning things which physicists maybe have seen or uh, you have seen. So what, <clears throat> what is the recap? So if one of the basic objects in the, in the whole discussion was this discussion of the Hodge decomposition. And we discussed that this is kind of a PQ Q decomposition into complex and uh, anti-complex uh, DZ uh, um, forms. For example, on the manifold, on the Calabi-Yau default, then we look at Kind of the middle cohomology where p plus q adds to d and then we can make this decomposition right i gave you here the decomposition for calabria threefold for the middle cohomology there's a three zero part a two one part a one two part and a zero three part yeah and the physicists we usually like to work with the three zero part alone and there is a reason for this which i will explain in a moment <coughs> Then we introduced a polarization, which we called uh, Q. Well, in our work, we don't call it Q, but I tried to keep at least this notation from the previous lectures. You will see there is a tendency to get a notational conflict, but some, something, everyone knows what that is. It's, <clears throat> it's just kind of the <clears throat> integral over the batch product or the mathematics. It's often written like a cup product between these uh, two forms yeah, on the middle cohomology. Of course, if you add D plus D, then you get 2D and then you can integrate because it's a complex D dimension. Then <clears throat> we talked about the vial operator. The vial operator uh, is, 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 is defined on PQ forms in this fashion. Yeah. And we often uh, in, in the direct computation, we get it as a version to represent what we call the Hodge star. Yeah. And if you actually go into um, uh, the, so the Hodge star is evaluated with a metric and if this metric is adjusted to the peak Q decomposition, you get the same property out. Yeah. So, so when we learn something about the veil operate, veil operator, we actually learn something about the Hodge star. And if we change the uh, Hodge star over the moduli space, but what, that's what we want to do, right? In string compactification, we actually think about how does the veil operator change with the moduli. And this can be very complicated. And the idea is that this, uh, this, this variations of Hodge structure capture this dependence. Then we introduce the base M, which is the complex structure moduli space in our uh, compactification. Then we had a number of groups floating around and mathematicians just say, oh, these are just the automorphisms of the respective forms which you can have. But I wanted to at least a little bit uh, repeat what, what that actually means. It is actually not very deep, but it's just it's a language thing. So what do I mean or what uh, do people mean when they say, oh, I mean, talk about this group G, which is the automorphism group of this Q. We just mean that um, if I 
add and group element on both sides, it's the same thing as uh, Q itself. Yeah. So the Lorentz group is the outermost basic group of the Minkowski matrix. Okay. And therefore, and that was also already shown. All of you know that this is just sp uh, 2h to 1 plus 2 for the uh, for Calabria of three forms. And what is 2 1? Uh, uh, this 2 1? Yeah. Uh, H, th this is uh, the dimension of this space. Oh, okay. yeah. So this is uh, S dimension H21. Yeah, so now it's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we always write this PQ like this. Okay. And, and this group we call uh, G. And then there were a number of other groups floating around. I don't know if I used the same symbols as were used before. But one group was, you can call V. And this is the group of elements when you act on this vector space, you get back the same vector space. So they actually preserve the PQ split. And then this is the first time when I enter the field, you already struggle. What is, does this equation mean, right? You have a group element acting on the vector space, gives a vector space. So how you think about this is always in terms of a basis. Really think of this vector space as being spanned by a number of vectors, and then you act with this group element on these vectors, you rotate them, you get a new vector space. You take the span of these new vectors and you have to check if they are the same vector space. This is what this equation means. Right? Group element acting on a vector space means acting on a basis. Sometimes, it, yeah. Okay. So this is what we mean by. Uh, um, by, by this group V, <clears throat> they keep the splitting invariant. And then uh, there was a group, we can introduce a group K, which is a, somewhat bigger than the group V, namely, which only keeps the while operator invariant. Yeah? Of course, if the, if the splitting is invariant, then also the while operator is invariant because it's just purely computed from the splitting. Right? But you can easily see that you can make operations which do not preserve this, but they preserve uh, the while operator. Okay, very good. Does the while operator coincide with the hot star only for primitive cohomology or for any? Uh, I think only for primitive. Okay. Uh, Thomas, maybe, maybe it's worth pointing out that the period domain is for just G mod V. Yeah, I, I come to this. Okay. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. Very, very good. That's, that's exactly why I introduced this group because these period domains are also something where I struggled with in the beginning, and and it's not that complicated. It's just the uh, uh, it's it's just something to, to to understand the language first. Now this was this story. Huh? So it's just about vector spaces and what keeps them invariant. Now. We turn to the variations of Hodge structure, and there we learned uh, that this PQ decomposition can actually change over the complex structure mod moduli space. So now we actually shift over this M and the PQ, the vector space, just think really of it as just a number of vectors, a basis, starts to rotate. Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. And, uh, and there we have learned that it's actually better to work with these vector spaces FP. Again, these are just vector spaces, nothing fancy there. And if you see this, maybe you don't quite see what this is, but if you once write it out, you just realize it's something very simple. F3 is just the three zero part. This is the thing which we often work with, which, which contains uh, our omega. No, this is the three zero form which we love and we work with. Yeah, and then if you go down, you just add to one, then you add two one plus one two, and then you add three zero plus two one plus one two plus two zero. So this is the full space as I already indicated before. Yeah? Why would you do that? Why would you do this? Now we have these vector space. Now we introduce yet another set of vector space. How annoying is this? So. <laughs> The reason why one does that is because if you do it like this, you can find at least locally a basis 
which changes holomorphically over uh, over the space manifold L. Yeah. There is, of course, a little bit of trickiness here because what does it mean that the vector space changes holomorphically? Right? The vector space you can take a derivative, and then if the vector space turns around, you can maybe have a rescaling of the vectors, and it's still the same vector space. Yeah. So, but this, this is very important in 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 the actual computations, but uh, we don't want to go into details here. So the use of vector spaces is very important because there is this rescaling freedom. And it's very important to always uh, understand that there is this freedom of making vectors longer and shorter and it doesn't change the story. And we know this also. If you remember when we work with periods and this omega, and we always say, oh, it's defined up to rescaling. And if you want to find something invariant, we have to take quotients between these things. When we introduce special coordinates, for example, we take a quotient of one period by another period, and then it's invariant. So the scaling is gone. And mathematicians like to keep this freedom around, and they keep it because they work with a vector space. Okay? So that's how they keep this freedom and show, nevertheless, that it's irrelevant. Okay, very good. Then one thing I wanted to also mention, and Matt already pointed to it. Now let's look at such a variation. So we, we, start, we start with some HPQ, some reference APQ, a fixed one, somewhere in the moduli space. And I want to change it to a new uh, HPQ somewhere else. Well, what can I do with it? Well, I can act with this group G on it, right? Because we want to have our PQ station uh, behelf well under this Q, this polarization. So I can act with a group G on it. So I can write an element here, a group element, right? Which rotates, which now has to depend on Z, obviously, right? Because I want to rotate it to this new structure. And I rotate this reference vector space into a new vector space. Yeah. In the spaces way, as I explained. Well, what are, what are the properties of this uh, phi? Well, phi, first of all, is an element of G. Yeah. However, there is a boring transformation. And this boring transformation is the ones which keep the reference structure invariant. So I have to get rid of them because they don't mean anything. Yeah, they don't do anything. So this information is not actually in this map. So I divide it out. And these are all, and, and what is this? Well, I don't, this is the period map. So it really, the period map is kind of how does the PQ decomposition rotate when you change over the moduli space? Okay. And this is what parameterizes these period maps, if I'm not thinking about monotony. And this is what was this D which was floating around all the time. Yeah. Sure. The polarization is conserved under, the, under this transformation. Yes. And why do you want, want it to be the conserved? Why is it important to the polarization to be conserved? Well, you want to use the same polarization all the time. So you don't want to take a new polarization. It, it should be depolarization for the whole variations of our structure, variation of our structure. So very good. So this is this period map, and this is this period domain, and we heard a lot about this. It's before. because, it's, it's because the, the underlying, the rank of more distance changes, right? and this yeah. is the intersection for everybody. So in the example here, it's kind of obvious that one doesn't want that, and abstractly you don't want that because, yeah, and it's not a good example anymore. I mean, physically, it's also like your mouse would be uh, the Q. I mean, is a product, right? So you would physically change quantity. So yeah, yeah, the Qs have to right, remain invariant because physics. Are, yeah. yeah. Okay, very good. So this is the, the V depends on which reference uh, you choose. I mean, it's, uh, and if it is smooth, it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. Yeah, and and that's why I was also able to write it down without telling you 
okay. what exactly I mean. It's just generally like this. But you're right. So if you would make go to a singular point, then this doesn't anymore work. Then there's a reduction, and then there's this whole discussion which which comes from this reduced domain and so on. That is about this reduction of this domain. Okay, oh, oh, oh. okay, anyway. So this is just what I wanted to say. So you see it there is. It's, it's, it's not quite as complicated as it sometimes sounds, but it's, uh, it's a different language, yeah? Now, then um, I'm still in the recap mode. <laughs> then we, uh, we discuss the nilpotent orbit theorem. I met, discussed this nicely. And now I just want you to kind of stare at it again. And... Uh, you can appreciate again the, the statement, namely um, the nilpotent orbit theorem says that if I go with some T, um, which I call X <coughs> plus I Y, yeah, or even I can put indices under that can have multiple coordinates, and I want to make these coordinates large. So I want to have y very large, bigger than one. So I, I approach some boundary point in the moduli space. Then I actually can write this as this F0 P, and this can still depend on other moduli, which I don't send to a boundary. Uh, that's totally fine. Okay. So this is the, the nilpotent orbit associated to such a variation of hot structure. So now you have this F, you go with one of these Fs, you go very close to one of these boundary points, and what you find is that you can write it like that. Yeah. Now you it's it's something. Um, where you almost uh, say, oh, isn't that kind of trivial, right? Because we know that the, the periods, they have to transform on the monotony. So what can you write down? Well, you can only write down this thing, which transforms properly. And then the whole story is about, well, how does this behave? Does this behave really well if you go to, to, the, to the boundary itself? What so, is this new parameter? Yeah, maybe I should just give it a, an F go. So uh, you can have a higher dimensional moduli space, and then you can send some of the moduli to the boundary, and other ones you can just keep arbitrary. And then it's an uh, important uh, statement that well, important. it's it's a it's a statement that you can just pull this here, and then everything just depends on this one. The other parameter is holomorphic still. And nothing fancy happens with other parameters. But let me take them out. This story is complicated enough. So I will just talk about this. Very good. Now, what is the local model? I gave you the local model before. The local model, so we would call it local model, maybe. And uh, the local model in the moduli space, of course is uh, this, this punctured disk, right? This punctured disk was always called delta, and the puncture was indicated by putting a star here. You take the star out, the puncture is gone, it's just a disk. Okay, that's just a notation. And then we said there is around uh, this monodromy, which we call T, and if it is uh, it's this only unipotent, we can introduce these N, which is the log T, okay? And then the most, one of the most important formulas for, for the whole lecture series was this formula, the conformal transformation, as we would say, which says that we can also map this to the upper half plane, where we use, so this is, it's also a little bit of notational clash, but I call this the set coordinate. Uh, and this, the T coordinate, right? So T goes to infinity at, at the boundary. So the boundary here is at infinity and uh, here the boundary is at set equal to zero. 
Okay. And the new oh, and the Nilpotent orbit theorem essentially says that if I go sufficiently far up here, then my uh, Hodge filtration can be approximated by this, and all the T dependence is appearing with this prefactor. And again, I alert you, this is a vector space identity. Yeah, so you can multiply things with, with T dependent functions if they are uh, just rescalings of the lengths of your vector. And in practice, you actually need to do that. Okay, very good. Now, Still, you might not be very happy because you say, oh, oh we never actually work with these, uh, with these things. And, uh, it, and, and um, we rather work with these periods. Yeah, so, thanks. We rather work with the period, the period integrals. And that's the thing which we really like, yeah. Um, so what does this nilpotent orbit theorem actually mean for the periods? Um, so this is not a recap anymore. So what does this mean for the periods? What are periods? With periods, I mean nothing else than in, in, in my, uh, my uh, discussion now, I mean just you have your manifold, which has a d comma zero form, and I take the integral over d comma zero form and some basis. This is what I call periods. Now, of course, you can extend these periods to include the other spaces, but as I said, we, we often like to use just these. Why do we do that? Well, if you take derivative, as Matt explained, if you take derivatives from this one, you end up in this space. If you take derivatives from this one, end up in this space, and so on. And in fact, for Calabial threefolds, you can span all of these Fs by acting with derivatives on this omega. For Calabial fourfolds, this is actually not true. There is some sort of rest which you don't reach with taking derivatives. This rest is still captured by Hodge theory because Hodge theory actually talks about all the pieces, not just about it. We, we like to talk about this, but for Calabial fourfolds, we actually learn, we had to learn in the F theory times, painfully learn that we should actually talk about this spaces independently because they, not all of it can be reached. Okay. This was a side comment for the experts. Now, what does the nilpotent orbit mean for this? And let me, uh, let me reduce to, well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, with this comment in mind that not everything necessarily can be reached, then what is the nilpotent orbit expression for pi? Right. Well, the first thing you would come up with is you write it like this, E A N I, and then I introduce some A zero, okay? So this is just a straightforward translation into this. But the whole point is, and that's the nice thing, <clears throat> Well, actually the nilpotent orbit says, the theorem says, not only this upper space is spent, it takes this form e to the t and acting on something which does not depend on t. It actually says that all of these spaces can be written like this. Yeah. Now what happens? What happens is when uh, the, what happens if I look at this first piece and I, in, I am in the situation where n acting on a zero is equal to zero. And this actually happens like in the Kony fold. Well, 
you are surprised because then it means, oh, but then the near potent orbit means that this is just a constant. So it does not even depend on T anymore. That's very weird. So it looks like Hodge theory shows you something really boring that the leading part in the Kony fold period is actually a constant. And to, to fix this, to keep the same information as in this statement, when going to the periods, we actually have to include exponential correction. Okay. So what I'm saying is this near put and orbit expression is not only fixing this leading term, but a number of these exponential uh, corrections. Why? Well, if you take a derivative of this, you have to reach all the other spaces. And these other spaces also have to take this form. Okay. What happened to the exponential? Uh, these are vector spaces. So if I take a derivative, this constant can go away. Then the, the, the first term starts with an exponential, but it's a vector space identity. So I can get rid of the exponential by scaling. And then I know that I need another correction term to span these other pieces of this filtration. Does that make sense? I think, let's see how we are. I prepared a little example of this. Um, let's see. Okay, so if n i equal to zero, then uh, the in I drop the in exponential correction dropped. information loss. When only working with I know, as we like to do. So was, we yeah. mean n applied to zero? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry. So what is one of the lessons we have to learn from this taking derivatives and dropping exponentials does not commute okay. and what is the idea the idea is to if we still want to only work with omega, right? If we only want to work with the upper piece and still use this technology, we should keep the exponential corrections, which allow you to span all the spaces. So L nil contains all terms needed. to span F P nil. Is and this only for Calabrian three volts or also for four volts? Also for four volts, you have to do that. But in four volts, I gave already the caveat that you not cannot span the whole uh, two, two part actually by only taking derivatives of omega. But you can still like- But the rest you can get. So. So what we need, for example, for flux compactifications and so on, uh, is often enough to just work with this. So it has nothing really to do with threefolds, but uh, it's a general lesson which one uh, should learn. And we term these essential instance on, uh, oh no, essential exponential corrections. If you know a bit about mirror symmetry, then you know that such corrections corresponds to instant horn, blah, 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 and then you could maybe call them instant or correct. 
Thomas, I have two notational questions. Yes. When you uh, written pi i more potent with exponential corrections, do you actually mean pi i there? No, I don't mean like, all exponential corrections. I mean, I, I mean only the correction. So this is stuff that varies in the boundary direction, like yeah. transverse to the degeneration. Yes. I see. So that's your state of it. And what does it mean to apply n, which is an endomorphism of the vector space, to a naught, which is a coefficient? Of some Very good. Yeah. So so again, it's it's in the basis sense. So you can you can again think of this. Uh, oh. I think that's also the superscript, which shouldn't be there. Ah, but this superscript shouldn't be there. So this is now, I think of this as vectors, right? Sorry, there's no I here. Uh -huh. Right, okay, got it. Sorry. Okay, very good. Now I prepared an example um, of how this works. And so how are we in time? Um, yeah, these things are always going slower than what one thinks. I, ex I prepared a small example for the conifold, and uh, where you can see this in practice. And let me do this very quickly, maybe. So the example conifold, because you might think that this asymptotic Hodge theory story is only powerful at large complex structure and so on, which is not. It's actually powerful at every boundary, no matter if it's finite distance, infinite distance. It just has to have these log monotony matrices, yeah? for, at least for this new put in all this story. So the conifold. So the conifold has a period which I write like this. I don't want to discuss how one derives this. You can do this with picker Fuchs equations and all of things, but you just believe me for a moment. And I just want to show you. And, and I'm sure you have seen these things before that it looks like this in a certain basis. And then uh, if I just pick out the polynomial part, I actually find this is just e to the tn, a zero. And for the conifold, the n is, uh, uh, as you can easily read off, you have to find where the logarithm is. Right, then you transform the, the phase of Z, and then you see that this period changes by some matrix N, uh, E to the N, and then uh, this N is easily read off with a lot of zeros, and then the, the lower block is this, and the rest is zero. Okay, there's just one single one, because there's just one single logarithm. And then you see, if I would just take the polynomial part as promised, I find one zero zero i. Okay, so it's a constant. Well, that's the, the constant leading uh, expression for this. Uh, so what is a zero in this case? This is a zero because n. If you act with n on this a zero, you see that it's actually uh, vanishing. Yeah, you see because the one is here, the i and this block. And the length, if I didn't do anything. Else. Okay. So to keep the full information, I have to take the first derivative of T uh, of the conifold expression. And I told you there's this very important expression relation between T and Z, and I will use that freely. So don't uh, uh, just make sure that sometimes I write T and Z, and of course I have to do that properly. And if I do that, I include some two pi i factor in front for convenience. What I find is this expression. So now you see there's an exponential there. Yeah. Because there was this logarithm, there's an expert. And uh, because there was this z dependence, there is an exponential, but I can pull it in front of everything. And what remains is 0, 1, t. Um, b over 2 pi i e to the 2 pi i t. Okay. And now what I can do is I can 
They can drop the exponential corrections. Now, after the taking derivatives, I can drop the exponential correction. And what I find that the A1, which I need to keep, is 0, 1, 0, 0. OK? And you can now proceed like this uh, in uh, generating all the derivatives. And then you can see that the f nil three is span is the span over c of this a zero, and f two nil is the span over c of a zero and e to the t n a one. Okay, you drop to the exponential because of the extra space story, as you said. Exactly. Yes. Yes. That's so that's the that's the magic why exponential yeah. corrections are kept by this form, which looks completely polynomial. Yeah. But sorry, what, why why is the t also dropped there? I mean, we lost uh, one step. So you kept just the one in the second position, or? I uh, know I kept both uh, because I want to write this as um, e to the T and A1. Ah, sorry, I see. I see. Mm -hmm. And then you see that this is exactly so this there is an action on, on, on exactly. Uh, which is not so trivial. You, you have an A1 yeah, yeah. where the action is actually non trivial. Non -trivial. Okay. And if you remember Matt's diagrams, that this A1 corresponds to the dot which is not annihilated by yeah. the Can you say again who is N in this case? So it's four by four and only one is in position three, two, or? Yeah, it's only in this low. Yeah, since I almost brought down all the. <laughs> zero, 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 so. zero, zero, and then zero, 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 zero. Okay, very good. And the nice thing is now you can also uh, compute the C, the C nil, and the C nil. C nil can be also computed. Uh, well, sorry. Uh, having done this, now you can proceed. You can do the same thing for F3 nil and F4 nil. I don't want to give the details. It's really something you can do on a sheet of paper quickly. And then you can write down all the vector spaces as the span of vectors. So this is spanned by this h to one nil is spanned by one uh, zero t zero one t and nil and so on. Yeah, so you can, and then the other ones are just the bars of these. So now we computed for the Coney fold the nilpotent orbit expression. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's very nice and it actually follows largely or it follows largely from these diagrams and from the fact. Um, it's a, one, one question, Thomas. Yes. It, why is, is there R1, R1, Rn in the, in the subscript? So it's because it, you can go like in different directions in the model. Why? Why, why, so why, is, why, is, so why are the A's labeled by R1? Ah, yes, because there could be multiple coordinates which we send to a limit. But in the coordinate fold, I just have one. Uh, in this example, I just one T. Yeah, because. So. Very good. And if you have this expression, then you can also compute the C nil. And the C nil is the Hodge star at the Coney fold, which is just in the leading order. And you will see that there's just no exponential correction. So this is just the Hodge star operator at the Coney fold. In this up, in this approximation, you see very powerful this uh, very powerful this machinery. 
Now it gets it gets even more beautiful because we know so much about the large complex structure point, it gets even more beautiful there. So at large complex structure, so there's another example, yeah? A large complex structure, so it's again an example. Large complex structure for a color VR threefold. For the color VR fourfold, you can look up in our papers. We also write down everything uh, uh, there. Um, we know that the periods, we know that from mirror symmetry, they can be written in the following form. Okay, plus I chi zeta three, eight pi zeta three, and one half a i j k t i. So these are the periods at large complex structure. And this is one of the instances where every, everyone uh, working in the physics community has seen this over and over again. You don't even have to discuss this term. Uh, it's like used in models and everything. So I don't spend any time on this. Uh, but for maybe for the mathematicians, that's the triple intersection of the mirror. Intersection of the mirror. And this is the Euler characteristic of the mirror. It's much more fancy than one thinks this expression because it uses more. Sense. This is for any Calabria or for some Calabria? It's for any Calabria, any Calabria three four. Yeah. And now the nice thing is this can be really neatly written as As this, and now you see, I even have multiple variables, so I can just really general, and there are no instant on, no is no essential exponential corrections needed. You can really neatly write this as this, where n k is zero 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 delta k i zero 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 zero. zero zero, zero, minus delta kj and zero and then minus the intersection number kij and zero, zero. Okay, I hope you can read this still. So, and then of course I have also have to read a zero and this is just one zero zero i zeta three uh, zeta three pi divided by eight pi cube. And I leave it as a homework to check that if you plug this in, these two things that you indeed get this. So it's just identical. In this so, so, so here you just didn't consider the isentrons, not because you don't I, need to consider. You don't them. need to consider them. Why do you not need to consider them? Because it's a point of maximal unipotency. So, if you act with these ends, you really spend the whole space. Okay. So you really get the full filtration just from these these pieces here. And the second makes it look like the variation is a notebook orbit, which it's certainly not. Yeah, so this is really just the limit. Right? This is close to the boundary. Yeah. So there are instant corrections to this. Yeah. So there are the exponential there corrections. should be an e to the gamma of t. Yeah, yeah. So there are plus order e to the 2 pi i. Okay. Um, there are no other polynomial corrections like the second chain class? No, the, uh, the second chain class can be absorbed in the rotation of the basis. Ah, okay, so that's why it doesn't That's why it doesn't appear here. So if you would be careful, which I'm not, <laughs> about the integer basis, and, uh, and Matt was actually careful, and I will not be careful, and you see this also in these expressions, 
then you would have this information about the second Schoen class there. So in this picture, this kind of integer basis is not so important. It's, uh, uh, well, in principle, yes, it just depends on the applications. We will discuss some applications, like how it grows towards the boundary. And then uh, you see just the power in which it grows. And there, the integer base is not important. But of course, in other questions, this can be important when you talk about quantization of charges, obviously important. And for what is a large complex structure you fit this into? So um, it's, it's, it's essentially the point where it's the point of maximal unipotency. So if you add up if you add up all these n's there, they, they generate really the highest possible monogamy you can have. So there are various ways. Uh, another yeah, the, I maybe lose too much time on this because, but but it's the point where you have the mirror symmetry to large volume compactification where you have everything being very large. So it's, a, it's one of these funny situations where, for the physicist, this is kind of very clear, <laughs> even so it's very complicated. And for the mathematicians who are not working on this, it's something new. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, uh, so this is the point where mirror symmetry is very well understood. <clears throat> so in fact, this is the only situation where uh, the, the essential instantons can be uh, ex essential exponential corrections. Can be dropped. Why do I explain all of this? Well, there are some physics papers actually which use this Newton orbit theorem. They use it in, in different boundaries and they don't keep these exponential corrections. And the point is, uh, you shouldn't do that because you lose information. Sorry, can I, can I ask one thing about? I mean, this essential. So, that, what's the physical meaning of the essential instantons with respect to the standard? Uh, I mean, do they are they special from the physics perspective? Or? Um, yes, in some sense, yes. So, the, the, you also need them, for example, that to 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 check that your metric doesn't degenerate. So, if you would not include these exponential corrections and you compute the Keller metric, the Val Patterson metric, it would actually degenerate if you don't include them. And for the conifold, but they are still washy distant from the point of view of the mirror. Well, from the mirror in the mirror part, you don't need them. So in the mirror part, these these instant correction they have a number theoretic meaning, a counting meaning. While in the other part, uh, I'm not sure if they have a counting meaning. Okay. Now, what is the summary of what I said so far? The summary is the information in Ni and F0P. So I'm apologizing that I have slightly different notation from that, but I, I call this F0P. So this is the thing which determines the nilpotent orbit. This defines uh, gives the periods in asymptotic. Uh, the regime uh, where y i is very large, yeah, or c i s i. It's a fact, and I don't want to elaborate on this. Actually, if I take the ends, I sum them up. The first I of them, this pair defines a mixed Hodge structure. Yeah. So you add up the first N 
uh, the first i of these ends, and you get a mixed hot structure. So what does this mean? That means that if I think about an asymptotic regime, right, where I have kind of, I go to this boundary with sending t, now, now I should change set one to zero, to this boundary here set two to zero, and this point here is set one, set two to zero. So I change to the set notation to have a nicer picture. Um, then uh, there is actually a mixed Hodge structure associated to this limit, namely the one which lives here. There's a mixed Hodge structure which lives here. And to this point, actually, I should actually associate three mixed Hodge structures. Namely, the one which comes from here, the one which comes from here, and the one where I add both of them together, both ends. And actually, when you say a limiting mixed hot structure, I think it's better to think about this as the collection of all of these hot, uh, mixed hot structures. And that's why there is this also this limiting in front, right? So it's, so, it's not so just a single. I mean, part of being, part of being the, your thing there being a mixed hot structure. Is that the graded pieces of the weight filtration of that MI have to be hot structures? And that's not true in general unless you apply E to the say, I times the remaining sum of the odds to that F prime. So you might have to do some. Ah, yes. Yeah. You, you might have to, yes. you know, in general, if that F dot yeah. P at the origin is R split, then the traditional thing is to take n1 comma e to the i n2 f yeah, one, yeah. right so i mean there's a subtlety there's a subtlety it's not really yeah. that important yeah yeah it's not it's not that important but you're absolutely right but still the what i'm stating here is uh, is, uh, is is up to the subtlety which you are completely right about it is correct and you should think about having at this point multiple mixed hot structures if that's it okay now, uh, let's move on. Now, why did I introduce all of this? So this was a pretty lengthy introduction to get to one simple fact, which is important for, uh, for our distance conjecture. Namely, we want to now compute distances. And how are we in time? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Namely, when we want to compute the Weil Patterson metric, I told you that it's computed from the logarithm of Q of omega and omega bar. And then I ex explained to you that if I go to a boundary, I can replace this omega by the near potent orbit uh, pi. I explained to you how to compute it, and I explained to you that the leading term. in this expression is Q of A zero bar, and then E to the T minus like this, N A zero like this, and then plus other corrections. And now you can show that this is always non-zero, but if N, Sorry, here yeah, I forgot an I. So you can check that this is a, that this expression is always non-zero, but if all the ends annihilate A0, like in the conifold, for example, there's just one which annihilates it, it's just a constant. Yeah. So then you have to include the exponential correction in order to get a well-defined metric on the conifold. I'll add this. And it works like a charm, yeah. So you can just do it, but with what I prescribed before, and you get the right answer. However, if n i a zero is unequal to zero, the leading term uh, is polynomially is, is a polynomial. It's a polynomial in y i. Yeah. And then if you compute the second derivative of this expression, you find something which goes like one over y squared. 
Yeah, and this is something very familiar. This is a, a hyperbolic metric. Right? This is what I gave in the first lecture, which was the, uh, this Poincaré metric uh, on the disk. Yeah? And now we get it from the, from the Weil Patterson metric, but we had to put in this condition that this is non equal to zero. Yeah. So this distinguishes the conic fold, which is at finite distance to infin infinite. So what is this di? Uh, is the highest non trivial power which you can act on A0 with, right? So what does that mean? That is that it's infinite distance requires that di is unequal to zero, at least for one i. By k di you know, j mean the i j bar coefficient of the number. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so this is the kind of the classification of what are the infinite distance? Uh, what is the condition to have infinite distance? So why is this infinite distance very easy, right? So if you compute the distance, then you'll get a logarithmic behavior. So you have to now integrate this uh, along a path towards the boundary, and you see that it goes like logarithm of y. Very important. So the distance, the distance, uh, goes like log of y. <coughs> so instead in the conic folder, you have to add this exponential and then it's fine it's, uh, because of this uh, exact k of the. Point. Yes. Right. So. And of course, it's not only true for the conic fold, but for all kinds of boundaries, it's true. In a higher dimension moduli space, this gets. Okay, very good. Now, having said that, now I have to classify the singularities, the boundaries. And of course, this was done before in the lectures. So I just have to sketch this again. And then I can pick the ones out which are uh, at infinite distance. So now the classification. Classification. Uh, so the classification, I want to just use the information of what Matt already uh, described in his lectures. So let's let's uh, let's draw these pictures again. Oh, yeah. And say this is a two zero form, and this is a zero two form, and this is a one one form. So what am I drawing here? Well, this is just the cohomology. When you look at the picture like this, this is just the cohomology split H E Q, or example for a K three. There are some two zero forms, some one one forms, and some zero two forms. Yeah. Just a middle cohomology. And now the, the the whole game, which was described before, was the statement that if I go to the boundary, what happens is that these, these spots on a K3, you have multiple 1-1 one, one forms, they start to move in this direction, like this. Yeah, they go out here. They can go out here. And the, there is a new object, which is not the HPQ, but what uh, Matt uh, introduced, the VPQs, these, uh, these Eline split. And what can happen is that this two zero form actually moves to the side. So this two zero form in the degenerate situation actually becomes a two one form. So they don't have to be on this diagonal anymore, but you can move successively up. So then it's here, 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 here. Uh, Thomas, the two the two zero form moves down to uh, yeah yeah. Oh, 
So one of them moves up, one of them moves. I see you've written it backward. Okay, fine. It's fine. Uh, now, now comes the, the killer for me because you, you've written P, Q. So I see. I see. Yeah. Uh, so now comes the killer for me. Why is this, this diagram so hard for me to draw? Even I worked so much with this. <laughs> because <laughs> Matt calls this diamond. And what does he draw? He doesn't draw a diamond. <laughs> he actually turns these things around. And when you look in our papers, we always turn everything into a diamond shape. Yeah, so that you have two zero zero two, uh, like two zero one one, and then a zero two. And then it becomes a diamond when you go to the singularity. Okay, something to get used to. Anyway, I didn't want to uh, change the notation too much. Okay, so this is what we uh, learned in, uh, in, 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 in Matt's talk. And in fact, if you look at these pictures and you understand that the N acts in these pictures always in this diagonal fashion, then, it, then you can translate the information in this picture just into the rank of N. Right. So for the K3, we find the following. We compute the rank of uh, n and n squared. And then you have three possibilities because you have three uh, pictures which you can draw. The first picture is this one. Well, n acts up and down, but there are no other dots here. So the rank is zero and zero. Then there is this picture here. And here you can just react with n on this one and on this one. So the rank is a two. But there, you can never act twice with n because there are no points which go down. So the rank can be two and zero. And then there is the other picture where this dot moves even further out to this point here. And now you can act with n going here and here. So you can act twice, n, n. So this is another picture, it's not in the same picture. And then what is the rank of n? It's uh, one and four, yeah. Very good. And now we are free. I don't. I Can see. you say what you mean by the rank? I mean, because it's, maybe it's two and one, the three things. Two, huh? of the three, the two and one. The... Say, say again. So in the third case, it will be two and one. Maybe. Yeah. Because the image of n is dimension two. You have to still. Two, two one, one. Yeah. So you mean the rank of the, uh, the pair of ranks? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's just the rank of n and the rank of n squared. Okay. Sorry, thanks. And what are these limits uh, in terms of K3? Um... Uh, so the limits, this is no limit oh. or, or some OB fold or something like this. This is a stable degeneration limit. Uh, like when you do the heterotic dual, the coupling limits, they are all of these type two. And this type three are large complex structure limits. So, so in the second case, the n is important to be the, in the tool. I mean, n squared is just zero. Uh, yes, exactly. Because the rank is zero of n squared. Calabria three. There, we do not compute only the rank of n, but we also compute the rank of n squared, and we compute the rank of n three. And now you can draw all these diagrams with uh, Matt hat, but he had only for two variables, but you can do that for n variables. And you find multiple types. And you can just read it off from these diagrams, right? This is really straightforward. <clears throat> like this. And then what you find is in this case is A zero zero then two plus B zero zero, then four plus 
C two comma zero and two plus D two comma one. Okay. Now you see that actually you cannot distinguish these two by this information of the rank, right? Because it could be that this A is equal to two B. And this is very bad because we want to distinguish one and two because one of them will be at finite distance, these ones, and these will be at infinite distance. So what distinguishes these two types? It's just uh, the eigenvalues of, so the eigenvalues of Q and the matrix when you insert the N into the quadratic form. And if A of them are negative, they are A negative, then it's this type, and if B are negative and two are positive, then it's this type. And here you don't need this, right? Because you see immediately which type it is. So now we classified all the boundaries, but just by computing the ranks of N, and is translated completely into these pictures, which uh, Matt was describing. But it's much handy, uh, well, it's very handy to use this in explicit computations. Sorry, why, why the powers are uh, n and n squared for k3 and n and squared and cubed for uh, Calabial 3? Oh, know. yeah, because the highest power is always the one of the dimension of the manifold, uh, right? So you can. Uh, you, if you think about your Hodge diamond uh, in the Calabial threefold, uh, you can just go three times down, and for a K3, just two times, and for a Calabria 4, four times. And in fact, so for a Calabria 4, you can read in our papers, there is a equally a classification. Now, of course, you have now five types, and all, all, of, these, all of these types have now two indices, A, B, and C, D, and so on. So you can do a complete classification, and this complete classification is just using these diagrams, these hot Hodgkin diagrams, which Matt described. Now we are already running over time, um, so sorry, I'm a bit confused. So this, does this second uh, row mean that the Bayes-Peter symmetric is is indefinite? I mean, because this seems to be like in your expansion. Of the of the of the Keller potential, you seem to get that right, right. in the minus. Log no, it's exactly because of this logarithm that this negative direction gets cancelled, and in fact, also this minus sign takes care of the side, the correct side. So this is something which we know very well with it's from the string theory experience, and now you see also where this comes from. Yeah. No, the very paper symmetric is positive. Definitely. In the cohomology of the Calabi-Yau, you have the dimension of H to one uh, tells you the size of this, right? And then these parameters A, B, C, and D are related to this dimension, or what? Yeah, you can you can give the, the boundary. Things that, okay. You give you can give boundaries how big A and B can be, and then you see if you have sometimes the the dimension of these cohomologies is not big enough to, to have uh, certain singularities because the n would have to be too big to act on this vector space in order to have this. Very good point. Yes. And uh, okay. Very good. Uh, and then before I stop, and then uh, when I come back in the second lecture, I will uh, apply this to these conjectures. Uh, and sketch how this is done. And, but I want to conclude on one thing. Now, I mentioned to you that if I want to characterize a point, which is at the intersection of, uh, so in, in a multivariable situation, I have kind of an intersection and I go here and here, and then I can go here where it degenerates further. I want to kind of capture this information using these types in a, in a diagram, right? 
and, 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 and Matt introduced these cubes, but I think there is a very nice way to represent this information. And we call this an enhancement chain. And uh, an enhancement diagram. And what do I mean by this? An enhancement chain is well, I record the type, say I send T1 to infinity, and I record the type, right? And I call it type A. And it comes from this list here in Calabria 3.4. And now I also send plus, I also send type K2 to I infinity. And of course this type will enhance and it will go to a more, a more violent singularity A prime or yeah, of B. And if you have more moduli, you get a whole chain of types and so on. Yeah, if you have more moduli. And it's actually important to keep all of this information. It's not only good to keep the last type, but it's important to keep all of this information. In fact, that there is something even nicer which you should keep. You should keep even the ordering. So what happens if I first send T1 to infinity or first send T2 to infinity? So there is our I zero type, so the, uh, the one where nothing is degenerate, and then I get type uh, type A, type A prime, and so on, and then I send both of them to infinity, and I get even more enhancement. Type B. And now you can you can draw a whole diagram and always capture the whole information. And it's in fact this whole diagram which specifies the properties of this highest enhanced point. Yeah. So you maybe have seen that other people, uh, Timo and others, they try to they classify boundary points in a higher dimensional situation. They are not just these types, they are not just the Kulikov types. In the higher dimensional situation, you have to record this whole diagram. And then even if you just have the three Kulikov types, you have more diagrams. And this is the information you need to classify what this point is, because you could move towards this point like this, and you see this type and, and then this type, or you could move towards this point like this, and then you see this type and this type. Is that, is that clear? And they are all geodesics on these possibilities. They can be all you can on any path, any path. So you just have to be uh, insufficiently close. <coughs> okay. Thomas. So if I try to go like for the critical line that is in between the two growth sectors, uh, what is the right enhancement? If I take both of them at the same rate, both both of them at the same rate. Well, then you have to. Uh, then you have to combine the ends in a particular fashion, and then you actually just go to directly to this. So you sort of behave like only one of the all I will do. So exactly. So you can pull it in front of all of them, and then the two ends come together in the two directions, and then it's in directly the highest touch. Yeah. Exactly. You get directly. Touch. And, and actually what we, uh, what we suggested is, why not you apply this idea to uh, the periods which we gave for the color Liao manifolds uh, for, the, for the large complex structure. So apply to color Liao 3 large complex structure. And you actually get a classification of intersection patterns. And which is invariant under coordinate, base changes, and so on. 
So you, and it's very easy to compute all of these types from what I gave you before. You just have to compute ranks of intersection numbers. Just go to a database, compute the intersection number, you compute the rank and you get an answer. Okay, very good. Now, um, let me stop here and then after, oh, <laughs> okay, and after the break, I will uh, discuss the application. Okay, thanks a lot.